the last thing that I want in as as a adjective attached to that experience is seepage. I guess it's a noun. My part of speeches have gotten screwed up, but seepage is bad. Welcome back to Privy. Privy is a podcast about bathrooms recorded from my home bathroom. I'm your host, Hunter Hoover, and I love bathrooms. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, hopefully, you you survived pranking season. If you if you had someone light uh, turds on fire on your doorpost, that that's not my fault. Um, I explicitly told everybody not to do so. Uh, so hopefully, they heeded my heeded my my warning there. Um, yeah. Oh shoot. I got a call. I got a text in a in a supply drop here. I forgot my I forgot the seltzer. Like I'm gonna have to grip and rip it here in a minute, so I'm gonna need the seltzer for that. You know what I'm saying? I wanna I wanted to as we as we start a new month here, uh, the month of April. I wanted to just review the goals of the rating and review system. So the the primary like driving force of the rating and review is. In the in the turn of the new year, we we wanted to do something to um, help give back to those in some small way who had gone before us. And as we sat down to try to figure out, well, what do we do for that? Um, what's a worthy cause? And there's plenty of them out there. And I'm not saying that we pick the only thing that's worthy, but we I kind of landed on this notion and and connected to you know one of our sayings. Thanks to um, Sam Bagenstoff. Shout out to Sam friend of the show here, um, former, former guest, uh, is that, that we need to keep pooping in the free world. Um, and something that came up was that the free world was not always free. And you've heard me say this at the end of episodes, but I wanted to hit you at the beginning of this episode. Hopefully you didn't just plus 10 by it or plus 30 by it or whatever your podcatcher does, um, to say that please go leave us a rating and review. Um, for every one of those we get, we are going to be donating some money to the Wounded Warriors Project. I think we're up to about um, almost fifty dollars total for the month for the year uh, twenty twenty three here, um, which ain't ain't bad. But it's it you know we could really you know get those ratings and reviews. If you've already rated or reviewed the show, share the show and tell others to do so. We would love for for those to go up, um, and so we can get some money sent that way. The other thing that it does is when you rate and review the show, especially if you pick that five-star option, it helps others find the show. I don't know how that works, but that's what I'm told. So that's the goal here. That's why at the end, I always hit you with, hey, rate and review and all that stuff. And I might do it, not do that as extensively this episode since I did it here at the, at the front. And I want to note, so my buddy, um, I, I, I can't remember. Yeah. So... I when I was growing up, I used to get um, these these Arizona teas. They were half mango tea, half iced, half half mango juice, half iced tea. And I used to get one of those with my dad. We would go mowing, and when we were done, we would stop at the Glacier Gateway gas station in Vaughn, Montana, uh, and and I would get myself a uh, mango half and half iced tea from Arizona. And sometime around 2011, just kind of Arizona quit not producing them, um, but they quit making those as readily available. And I thought they were kind of gone forever. Um, and I had resolved myself to that fate. You know, whenever I'm in Winco or whenever I stop into a gas station, I always peek just in the hopes that maybe I'm going to track one down. And I, and, and, and I haven't recently. But a couple weeks back, we were at and Awana Grand Prix, uh, if you follow Privy on social, you saw um, our, our race car uh, for the Grand Prix. Um, we had the toilet on the back representing there. And my buddy, Titus, again, another former guest of the show, friend of the show, Titus comes in with, a, with an Arizona mango half and half iced tea. And I almost lost my mind. It's probably been 12 years since I've supped on this sweet nectar. Um, and, and like, I borderline stole this thing from him. Like I essentially sob storied him until he like either was sick of hearing it and just gave it to me out of pity or out of sheer, I'm done talking to this guy. Titus, a rad dude, 
hooked me up with a couple more. I've already downed one. But that that first one, I'm confident, was outdated. And I'm not saying this to disparage Titus, because it was his drink and I and I talked him out of it. But man, it 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 really flew through me. Um now I felt fine. It tasted delicious. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. But let the record show. Uh, I think it was about two years expired, which then I thought, you know, maybe they did discontinue these and, and that's why these are so expired now. Uh, but it turns out that's not the case. Arizona is still making this beverage. Uh, the trick is you have to buy it off Amazon. You can't buy it from Arizona directly or apparently from most gas stations, except for some tiny little gas station convenience store in, I think, Sweet Home, Montana. Um, or sorry, Sweet Home, Oregon. <laughs> anyway, it's just, you know, they're, they're so delicious. And, and man, did I, oh gosh, I, I went hog wild. I'm too deep on these. I'm fixing to buy myself a case off Amazon. Just pull the trigger on it. You know what I'm saying? Something that gets brought up a lot when I tell people that I make a podcast about bathrooms is like, well, what do you talk about? And something that gets talked about a lot when we start talking about bathrooms is how we're going to deal with all that stuff. I mean, nowadays, the things people eat truly are heinous and they're the byproducts and, and the byproducts are not much better. I ate 18 peeps today. My family and I did a peeps taste testing of all the seasonal flavor of peeps. Um, and I did consume 18 peeps in about a five minute setting. And I did feel absolutely terrible afterwards. Um, I'm here to tell you definitively that the tropical peeps are a no fly. I was literally crying. The tropical peeps were so disturbing. But uh, I think my favorite was either either just like Dr. Pepper or cake. The fruit ones are a miss for me. The fruit ones are a miss. But like, imagine the types of byproducts I'm making having eaten 18 peeps in one sitting. Most folks who live in an urban area or suburban setting have their bathroom hooked to a sewer line. And we have talked at length about sewer systems. Um, they're great. Uh, I was listening to a podcast this week. They actually covered a topic that we've already covered on the show, um, the, the Great Stink uh, of London. And they were talking about how revolutionary the sewer system and, and um, Basil Get, I think was the guy's name, who put that sewer system in and revolutionized and helped deal with cholera in the area. You know, sewers are really good. They're great. But the other alternative to a sewer system is... And, and being hooked to that local in infrastructure is to have a septic system, often featuring a tank on your property for your toilets. It has taken us a long time to get to today's septic systems. Like, the, the, the septic system technology that we have in place today is pretty good. But the history of it... it, it and we're going to look at the history of septic systems. The history of our septic systems is wrapped up in the history of cesspits. The trouble is, the definition of a cesspit, besides being my friend's bedroom, every time, dude, every time I went, everybody had this friend growing up where you went over to their house and you go in their room and it's like, do you have a floor? I can't find it. It's, it's missing under the litany of trash and Legos. So besides that friend's f bedroom floor, a cesspit is, is somewhat like both a specific term, but is also used in a general sense to describe a, a swath of things. Early reports say that settlements in Mesopotamia, in Ur, and Babylon had a localized cesspit as early as 3500 BC. Now, these may have, may have been connected to homes via rudimentary plumbing, via a brick-like, brick-lined, essentially trough, where they would rinse the water down 
to help it flow towards this common collecting area. While they still often emptied their skeet into the street, or they would carry it outside the city and dump it into a common dumping space, the act of burying it, often dumping it into a pre-dug pit closer, was a kind of a growing trend. Like, as people began to want to go outside the town less, or had less free time to just be digging and, and or, or had, sorry, had more free time to just dig a pit closer and go in there, um, we see these, these cesspits start to pop up. The reason that, again, that they did this is if you had to spend time carrying the bucket of brown slosh outside of town, you know, and you know that the low man on the totem pole is getting that. I don't think I can use that phrase anymore. The low man on the non-cultural uh, definitive pole. Um, yeah, we're not going to talk about what that pole is. All right. But the low man on that, he would be the one that's carrying the sloshy, sloshy stank outside the city to dump it. And you're wasting work time. You're wasting farming and agricultural time and other such precious time that you could be doing other things. As such, the cesspit was likely originally an attempt to bring the dumping closer to the living quarters, thus saving time. And we, we talked about this when we talked about porta potties. They a lot of early porta potties began to be installed as a way for um, industries to cut down on the downtime of people who had to leave the work site to go use a bathroom somewhere. They put porta potties in. So that way, these workers wouldn't have to waste all their time walking back and forth. It, it, you know, it really shuts down the notion of m the boss makes a dollar and I make a dime. That's why I shaz on company time. You know what I'm saying? But they, they caught on and they were trying to install these, these pits and these porta potties. It's the same idea. It was also likely like these cesspits were probably also like you go out of your house and you look down and it's like, oh man. Tony's eating too much corn again. How do you know? Because Tony's turds are just laying in the street. And you're like, I, I have got to be seeing Tony's turds less. I, there has to be a way for me to see Tony's turds less every day. It must, there must be a way. And so they begun to dig cess cesspits as a means to still, you know, Tony still can eat the same amount of corn, but now he dumps it in the cesspit or drops it right in the cesspit via the bungholio itself. What's interesting is the history of cesspits and septic systems, it kind of skips over the Greeks and the Romans in a huge way. Like, even though the Greeks and the Romans are often touted as having huge advances in sanitation, their advances are more related to plumbing and not septic systems. After the fall of the Roman Empire, humanity went through both a regular Dark Ages and what is called the Sanitary Dark Ages. We've talked about this time period a lot. Um, people were pouring turds in the streets and rivers. The care for water system was not of high value and as such disease spread. Cholera was on the rise. Things got so bad, especially throughout Europe. We noted the Great Stink, that eventually the, the need for change was evident. We can't, we can't just keep dumping this stuff in the street, Tony. The river's not an answer either. The question became, how many people have to contract and die from cholera? And how bad do the streets and rivers have to smell before we make a change? My answer is zero and not bad at all. Before the big sewer system rehaul in France in the early 1500s, King Francois, King Francois ordered homeowners to build cesspools on their properties to begin depositing waste into now i want to note it it just says waste so like obviously they're going to pee and poop into these pits but they would also dump all sorts of crap in there broken pottery broken dishes trash animal byproducts bones they i mean they tossed everything in there medical waste 
These, these pits and these pools were truly heinous. As the cities grew, and the goal of these cesspools and the cesspits that derived from them um, was they were designed to cut down on the waste on the surface and the waste on the rivers. Now, there's a couple problems that, that came from this. Oh, yes. The supply drop has arrived. Ooh. What do we got here? Tangerine La Croix. Oh, yeah. As the cities grew, emptying waste into the streets and rivers was too much of a burden. And the time it took to do the chamber pot hollow away, I mean, at this point, you're probably just dumping it into a wheelbarrow to get it out of town. It's not efficient. And so cesspits and cesspools began to be used and dug all throughout Europe in the 1500s. These cesspits were usually cylindrical pits dug in the ground and were sometimes lined with bricker stone. Now, the bricker stone was to help with waste management because it would allow water to pass through the brick and stone into the ground below. Now, the... uh, this is, this is a concern because while this means that they have to be emptied out less often, if, if Tony's corn turds are just letting that corn turd water seep into the groundwater supply, if they have a well nearby, you can see where the cholera friends, the col- cholera friends are just going to be right back. Like, we have, we have not moved too far away. Some had a bottom which was open to dirt. Others were lined with with a material that took on a type of soak pit system in which the materials would be broken down and the water would seep out. This was more common in most of... outside of cities. Inside of cities, they, they often had them completely lined and they didn't soak down as well. They actually filled up. The thing about storage here, um, if anybody, if any of y'all have an iPhone, you know that your cloud storage is probably full. If you got Google Drive, you know that your Google Drive storage is about full. If you've ever bought an Amazon Fire tablet, you know what I don't understand? Old Jeffrey Bezos has above a flip jillion dollars, and he can't figure out how to make a dang Fire tablet that doesn't have two gigabytes of storage on it. It's like, well, buy my memory card. Well, then the freaking housing on the Amazon Fire tablets is butt, and it screws up the housing of the memory card 100% of the time. I, I have bought my children collectively five Fire tablets, and only one of them has never had a problem housing the memory card. You tell me, Jeffrey, like, I've got, I've got four switches in my home. They all have a memory card in them. And the folks at Nintendo figured out how to let me put a memory card in it and not have it screw up within a year. So you tell me. Like, but the problem with storage, well, I, I'm off track. I got angry at Bezos. Story of my life. But the point is, is if you have storage, it will fill up. That's 100% guarantee. It's only a matter of time. Like if you give it long enough, the potty shots and the stupid videos of me eating crap are going to fill up your storage. Storage is temporary. Now, these cesspits were usually dug about three feet across and six to 10 feet deep. Um, that's, a, that's a shallow grave for a short man. This said, smaller cesspits could hold about 250 gallons. Um, And that's solid and liquid gallons. And larger sized ones were dug to hold up to 500 gallons. That's a lot of poop and pee and just general garbage being removed from people's lives. And again, these European, these 1500s European cesspit users they didn't understand something that we all know. You don't flush things that can't be flushed. They would dump all sorts of junk into these cesspits. Family trash, broken housewares, non-body function related trash. 
in short, these pits filled up pretty quick, like quicker than you would want. It is estimated a single cesspool for homes in Europe and America, where these were primarily used, needed emptied about every six weeks. Again, you could, based on the build of your pit, have a certain amount of liquid that seeps into the soil, and you might get yourself an extra week or two. Also, I should note that the dietary toll that was probably being taken on these pits was much less back then. We are just we are just garbage people and we eat garbage and our bodies have learned how to like process what is essentially raw nuclear waste at this point in our food. I think of Mr. Domini sharing on his trip to Ecuador where he's, you know, like he's eating this fruit that is so sweet and so good and it's better for him here we are did i happen to mention i ate 18 peeps today (laughs) and you could based on the build of your pit have a certain amount of liquid that seeps out i like to think that these people who had these cess pits and these cesspools were kind of like these people that are smacking their vape on the streets you know they got these guys that are just so dang addicted to vape and they got to be always sucking on their cotton candy nonsense. And and what's funny to me is the dudes that got the rigs and they're like, oh, I, I built my rig. Oh, I got a new. It's like I that's what I think of when I think of these people with. Oh, oh, I just oh, I put in the extra extra thin bricks. So I get an extra four inches on. My, you know what I'm saying? They, they got their cesspit rigs. More shallow cesspools can have bacteria, which actually help cleanse the liquids and might that might seep into the ground hey that's fun little little symbiotic relationship there hey that's for all the that's for all the kids in science class i'm not going to define symbiotic relationship i'm just going to say it which is always helpful but even then like solids don't completely break down and there usually ends up with a layer of human nasty sludge at the bottom gunk if you will. Cesspools could also be negatively affected by freezing and rainwater. You know, it starts to rain and it's like, cover the cesspool because we're going to have to empty it three weeks sooner. As was noted, cesspools attached to homes may need emptied as often as every six weeks. That's, that's pretty frequent. Like, I don't even wash my car every six weeks. Larger cesspits often where pools were dumped or emptied into, would need emptied every eight to 10 weeks. That's a lot of human waste. It's a lot of emptying. In the words of Mike Rowe, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. And in this case, the folks doing those dirty jobs were called gong farmers. In Tudor England, the term gong farmer began to be used to describe the men and young boys who often assisted them who had the astute pleasure of digging out privy pits and emptying out cesspools and cesspits. What a job. I, I don't know if there were unions back then, but I feel like this is one of those jobs where I, I understand why a union might exist for it. You know what I'm saying? Gong farmers didn't have complex vacuum suction systems. You know, they, they ain't walking around with a Luigi ghost vacuum to suck up the turds. High-tech storage containers were not a thing. They had a shovel, hard work, and hopefully a really nice pair of boots. But you know what? More on gong farmers in another episode. This is not their episode, as fascinating as they may be. The cesspits needed emptied, and the gong farmers were the men who rose to the task. But even with the help of these heroes, things were stinky. And there was also the problem of, as we have mentioned before, seepage. Like any time in my experience, in my humble experience of pushing 30 years on this green earth, when I am interacting with human Ralph, Reek, or otherwise, the last thing that I want in as, as a adjective attached to that experience is seepage. I guess it's a noun. My part of speeches have gotten screwed up, but. Seepage is bad. 
In every instance, when talking about poop, seepage is always bad. There was no regulation, and this led to a number of problems. First, well, wells. You know, where you get drinking water would be dug too close to cesspits, and you would think that this would be a no-brainer. Like, it would be easy to cess out. <laughs> I get it, because of the cesspits. It's punny. But, like, you dig two pits. One pit you're going to dump human crap into. Like, everything you just ate, it reeks, it smells of death. You're going to dump all that in this pit. And then just matters of just feet away, you're going to dig a well where you will draw all of your drinking water and your bathing water and all, like, come on. Like, maybe build them farther apart. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think the problem is, is you would have to build them significantly fa farther apart to avoid contamination. That's the trouble. Before reforms began to be made of cesspools and cesspits in Baltimore, it was reported that the city smelled like a billion polecats. Now, I've never smelled a polecat, but I have smelled a regular cat. And I'll tell you what, they stink. I, ugh. Imagine one, imagine a polecat. You know what I'm saying? Low man on the polecat. Smelled like a billion polecats. It was said of Chicago, the smell could knock you down. And so reforms needed to be made and reforms began to be made in the 1800s. The cesspits had to have more sturdy walls of stone or concrete to reduce seepage. I do a lot of reduced seepage in my day-to-day. -day. Just saying, but usually concrete isn't as involved in the process. But now, with less seepage, you also had to remove the liquid waste from the tanks more often. The tanks would fill up faster. You're low on storage. It is estimated, to give you an idea, that a large city in Europe would need to have about one to need to have emptied about 100 cesspits per night. The gong farmers are in business. But with the rise of sewers in, in cities and sewer reforms, which we have talked about, cesspits and cesspools and privy pits were filled, abandoned for the up-and-coming sewage systems. There were still cesspits being used in the 1900s within some of these cities. And, and I got to note, it was not uncommon for in, in the heat of the day for, for them to like toss, especially coals and ashes, and, and for these cesspit, cesspits to catch fire. Like you would have burning pits of crap. It was, it was not a good thing. With further technology developing and and also so for those of you who don't know I'm I'm a Bible nerd um when like so when it when it, Jesus talks a lot about hell and, and Gehenna there was a valley outside of the city where they would dump their waste and sometimes it caught fire in the heat and so like you can see the picture here like this cesspit it's hell. It stinks. It's awful. It's contaminated. It's got disease. It's hot. It's burning. Ugh. But with further technology developing and when sewer hookups would be too costly, many municipalities allow for and have installed septic tanks. Septic tanks, much like their cesspit predecessors, are underground tanks, often made of concrete, fiberglass, or plastic or a combination of these where sewage flows into for treatment now the primary difference between a septic tank and a cesspit is and this is a very important difference a septic tank is closed because it's a tank and not a hole in the ground that's an important distinction to make another important distinction is septic tanks should not have seepage <laughs> And again, we are pro-no seepage here. The primary treatment system inside of a septic tank seeks to break down the solid materials for more efficient disposal. <laughs> well, may I say. 
They're like on-site sewage treatment facilities inside of this tank buried under the ground on the property. The treated liquids are often then drained into a septic drain field. Septic, the term, quote, septic, is the term for the bacterial environment that breaks down the human waste inside the tank. Now, it should be noted, you can't completely liquidize everything. And this buildup is called fecal sludge or septage. And much like the cesspits of old, it needs removed. You got to get the septage out of the septic tank. And so much like, again, Luigi Mario slurping up ghosts, we have special crap vacuums which come and slurp up the septage. It's great. Technology has made our lives better. Again, septic tanks can hold up to 2,000 gallons. They often have two chambers, and when one is filled, it spills over into the other, which causes that tank to let out liquid into the septic drain field. It's, it's a really cool system. Um, it's kind of like a closed system. But the thing is, is septic systems need maintenance. Like, you can't just install one and walk away and think, well, 20 years later, this thing is going to be just fine. Like, they need maintenance. The maintenance of a septic system is often the responsibility of the resident or property owner. And some forms of abuse or neglect include excessive disposal of cooking oils. Don't dump oil and grease down. If you have a septic septic tank, it is for it is for poopy products only. These are hard for the septic system uh, inside the tank to break down. Flushing non-biodegradable waste items such as cigarette butts, cotton bud swabs, menstrual hygiene products. Like don't flush that. We the number of times I would see kids flush nonsense at my previous custodial job, quit flushing that stuff. Don't flush food waste. Quit flushing chemicals. Like, too much of those chemicals kills the bacteria needed in the septic tank for the system to operate properly. If you have a septic system, make sure that your cleaning products are septic system safe. Wa some water softeners can can actually like dilute the wastewater and make it less effective. Roots from trees can, can poke through the septic system. Dear Lord, what a problem that would be. Playgrounds and storage buildings cause damage to a tank, like the weight pushing down on them. If you build them on top of it, you could crush the tank possibly. Excessive water entering the system may overload it and cause it to fail. High rainfall makes it back up. Over time, biofilms develop on the pipes of the drainage field, which lead to blockage and referred to as biomat failure. You do not want blockage. It's not a perfect system. Septic systems are good, but they're not perfect, and they have a rich history, often could not composed of no fiery pits of crap. If your, if your septic system gets blocked up, if it hasn't been treated, it can go reverse. And trust me, I know something about when septic systems go reverse. I shared on, on the episode where I quit being a janitor what happens when the septic system goes reverso. It explodes portions of the septic system into your domicile. You don't want it. Trust me, I stepped in it. You don't want it. It's, it smells awful. And it is a biohazard. Septic systems make up about 20% of home waste management in the United States. And most of these exist in rural communities where access to sewer infrastructure does not exist or would be too costly to the municipalities or the residents of the area to install. And so, we can be thankful for septic systems. First, that they are not the cesspits of old. I think we can also be thankful for, for sewage and sewer lines. We can be thankful for vacuums. Because thanks to very good vacuums, we don't have to get waist deep in crap to fix these problems as often.
I say as often because I'm sure it still happens some. Check, check your septic, friends. Make sure you do those inspections. This brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it, it truly does mean a lot that you would listen to me talk about septic systems and cesspits for so long. I, I, I have a blast researching this stuff and sharing it with you. I hope you have a blast. If you do have a blast, share the show. Just post it on social media. Send it to a friend. Say, hey, listen to this. Guy's a ding-dong, but he's, he's my ding No, wait. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to leave a rating and review. We already did that at the top of the show. But follow us on social media. We are at PrivyCast. Uh, send us an email, privycast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Episode comments, suggestions, concerns, pictures. Eh. Um, feel free to tag the show if you've got crazy stuff that you're finding out in the wild about bathrooms. Feel free to just add that privycast, hashtag privycast on any of those. Um, just that way, you know, the show can, it's easier for me to see the things that y'all are seeing. Uh, and we'll just kind of help build that community. We gotta we figure out what to call the people who listen to this. The privy heads. Yeah, it's a work in progress. We'll sort that out. If you have thoughts on what we should be called, um, feel free to include that in your email. As always, we want to thank Kevin McLeod and Poddington Bear for the use of their music. Thanks, Kevin and Poddington. This has been another episode of Privy. Thank you so much for joining us. Keep pooping in the free world. Wash your butthole. And... As always, don't forget to flush. <laughs>